Welcome back to the Bitcoin Layer. I'm Nick Batia, and today we welcome back Caitlin Long. She is the founder and CEO of Custodia Bank and a longtime Bitcoin advocate and industry participant. Caitlin, great to see you. Hey, Nick, it's great to see you as well. Thanks for having me on again. Of, of course. So, Caitlin, you always bring us the industry Wall Street veteran perspective when it comes to Bitcoin, Bitcoin regulation, and most specifically, the institutional adoption and banking relationship between Bitcoin and traditional systems. So I want to set that up for our audience and get right into how you are viewing the latest developments with the Fed and their Fed Now program. You had some interesting thoughts there comparing who they are allowing into this system versus who you think they should be allowing. So talk to us, what is Fed Now? And what is your opinion on how they've rolled out the system? Well, FedNow has been in process arguably since 2008 when the Fed applied for a trademark on the term FedNow. Uh, it really got going with the Faster Payments Initiative, which I believe started in 2015. Uh, and then the work started on FedNow in 2019, and it officially rolled out last week. Uh, it's not what some of its biggest critics are saying, a CBDC or a prelude to that. All it is is a better version of Fedwire. But it's still operating on antiquated technology. It's not programmable and it's not cross-border. So uh, what it is is a, is a better version of Fedwire. It's something that, that, that should, have, should have been upgraded from the 1970s to the 1990s and wasn't. Um, and now we've got it upgraded. Uh, it is, uh, there were a handful of participants that were uh, uh, approved by the Fed to launch. Interestingly, not all the large banks. Uh, it was a, a mix of, of, of large banks, medium-sized banks, and small banks. Um, and there was even a, a, a non-U.S. Fin based fintech in there as well, which I called out. The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by River. Make sure to check out river.com today or the link below in the description. River is our preferred place to purchase Bitcoin. Now, when you're buying Bitcoin, guys, there are several considerations. Number one, should I be using an exchange? Is the exchange custodying their own Bitcoin? Is the exchange using platforms to custody that we don't know? Is the exchange leveraging its Bitcoin for other purposes? Well, with River, we know that River does not use leverage of any kind. River also uses its own multi-sig solution so that your Bitcoin are not held by anybody else. So it's a very important thing to understand about what River offers. Now, River also has Lightning Network integration and a lot of other really exciting features. Go check out river.com today. So it's important to come back to this idea. The Fed's new system, FedNow, it's not a CBDC. You say Correct. that because C a CBDC is a new instrument that hasn't existed before. But what FedNow is simply a new way to transfer the current monetary instruments, which are essentially deposits at banks. So yes. FedWire, the wire system is the system that the Fed has used for decades now. And that's how banks move money between each other. So this is bringing the technology into a, a slightly more modern realm. But what you're saying is that it's not critical programmable. It's not a cryptographically accessible ledger of any sort. And so it doesn't Correct. exhibit any uh, semblance of what the Fed is already talking about in depth, which is its CBDC. So maybe you can just talk about really quickly, where do you think the Fed is in their CBDC? Um, we become basically balanced here in that they really want this, but that it would have to be fully legislated, which seems next to impossible right now, given the political landscape. So how do you view CBDC as it stands today with respect to the Fed? Well, uh, I have no better insight into that than anybody else. Uh, the, uh, Fed now is, is just a, like I said, faster version and, and 24-7, 365 version of Fed wire. 
Uh, the perception is that by speeding up payments and making it available 24-7, 365, even though it's at it's small dollar amounts in the grand scheme of things, most banks are limiting it to $100,000 per transaction. There's an aggregate $500,000 limit in the system right now, right? So if you think about what we just had the conversation on with the $250,000 FDIC insurance limit, Many businesses, when they make their payroll payments, that payment is more than $250,000, right? Um, a medium-sized business making a monthly payroll is, is going to be writing a, a check bigger than that, uh, much less a large business, right? So that gives you some sense that it's not useful for everything, certainly not now. Um, but the issue that I think that the, the folks who have been their biggest critics are confusing with Fed now is the privacy issue. That privacy issue really has nothing to do with the back end technology, which is what the Fed upgraded here. And it is an upgrade, and they did they did launch it. Uh, so finally, it is here. Um, and again, Custodia has said all along we expect to be a user of Fed now, um, but you need a Fed master account, right? So the Fed is the gatekeeper uh, on on who gets to use it. Um, um, FinTechs cannot directly use it. Uh, those who have been denied FedMaster accounts cannot directly use it. Uh, and uh, the Fed is picking and choosing winners, as it usually does, um, in terms of who, who gets to use it and who doesn't. Um, but um, it ultimately, you know, candidly, I think, has been surpassed by the payment technology that is stablecoins, because stablecoins are programmable and stablecoins allow you to move U.S. dollars at essentially the speed of light, anywhere in the world. It doesn't have to go through another central bank's um, settlement system. And, uh, uh, but, but again, stepping back, the CBDC piece, the Fed has said that it's not going to issue a CBDC without congressional authorization. Um, the Fed doesn't always act within the boundaries of the law. Uh, so, and by the way, the Fed has uh, a history of changing on a dime uh, the things that it says. So. Uh, one, th one, one day might, it might change drastically to another. There are certainly those who have spoken publicly in favor of a CBDC within the Fed, uh, and there are others who have been more cautious. So I can't tell you where things really are with a CBDC. I can just underscore Fed now is not a CBDC. The privacy issues that the critics are, have been raising are not new. They, the, the banks have been essentially deputized as law enforcement agencies on, on financial crimes. And this has been true, to be honest, for, since, the, since the Bank Secrecy Act was first enacted under the Nixon administration. And it's been expanded multiple times, ironically, mostly by Republican administrations, including the Trump administration. So while the biggest critics of it tend to be more liberty-oriented folks who tend to be more um, either Republican, small government Republicans, or um, classical liberal Democrats, uh, like RFK Jr., for example, um, it's been the Republicans who have been expanding it. It's not been the Democrats as much uh, who have been expanding the authority of the Bank Secrecy Act and deputizing the banks to be law, de, de facto law enforcement agencies. Well, and it, it is important to, even if your conclusion is that we're not really sure where it stands, that in itself is important. Number one, that they have decided or the Fed has stated that it would have to be legislated anyway, but that the Fed has a pattern of not following the rules or pivoting on a dime. So it is important to keep all of these things in context when thinking about a CBDC. Fed now does not equal CBDC, uh, but we have to be watching the way that the Fed is working toward, I guess, its technological goals and what they're publicly stating. Now, you bring up stable coins. Quickly, before we move on, do you agree with the premise that the stablecoin system, USD denominated as it is evolving today, is a modernized euro dollar system, meaning an offshore unregulated yes. dollar system? Yes. And this is where you and I, when we first connected, we, we just vehemently agreed. We're both you know, uh, students of the euro dollar system and uh, some of the shenanigans that take place in traditional finance. And uh, you're absolutely right. Stable coins are a version of euro dollars. And here's the irony. Uh, just as in the 1950s, when euro dollars 
were created, I should step back and define what is a euro dollar. It's a dollar issued by an offshore bank. So it's not issued onshore in the United States. It's just a dollar balance. Anyone can issue an IOU dollar balance. Uh, technically, in the United States, you have to be licensed as a bank to do that. Uh, but, uh, but, but that's not true offshore. There are offshore banks that issue dollar balances. And the history is it got started when uh, the U.S. weaponized the dollar against Russia during the Cold War because the oil market settles in U.S. dollars. That's an agreement that was created with OPEC uh, subsequently. But um, the market evolved that way after World War II. And uh, Russia is, of course, a major exporter of oil. And so it was it needed a place to put its U.S. dollars. The U.S. dollar banks uh, onshore in the U.S. were not servicing it. It didn't trust the U.S. dollar onshore banks in the U.S. anyway. And so it got British banks to agree to hold those U.S. dollar balances. And thus the euro dollar market was born. And it's been growing um, at an exponential rate in the last, uh, say, 25 years. Uh, but, but it does have its origins in the 1950s. Here's the, here's the point, though. The Fed lost control of that. The, had the Fed at the time said, we are not allowing offshore banks to, to hold U.S. dollar and issue U.S. dollar balances. Those are not U.S. dollars. Then it would have been like these non-fungible um, forward foreign exchange markets, which are which are really small relative to spot in a, in 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 a lot of cases because they're they're not directly tethered to the actual underlying um, and the, the non deliverable forward market is what I'm talking about for example but um, and that's because you can't get access to the underlying in, in in certain countries where there are capital controls the U S could have gone that route it did not and by choosing not to it certainly foster globalism and and trade but by the same token the fed lost control and there is a real debate over whether the fed really truly controls the dollar and it's a legitimate debate because the offshore us dollar market is so much it, it actually grew to be bigger than the than the onshore us dollar market and um, and, and so what the us has done is over the last couple of decades work with organizations uh, like the Bank for International Settlements and then, of course, uh, other organizations like the IMF and World Bank to try to reinforce the control that it has, but it lost control. So now how does that come back to the point about stable coins? Stable coins are, are just the latest incarnation of euro dollars. Back to your question. So one would think the Fed would want to grab hold of that given the history of the Fed losing control of euro dollars and ensure that only Fed-regulated banks are issuers of US dollar stable coins. But in fact, actually the Fed has done 180 degrees the opposite. The Bitcoin layer is sponsored by Foundation Devices. Now, we all have talked about the dangers of letting your coins stay on an exchange. The importance of withdrawing your Bitcoin to self custody is really part of understanding what Bitcoin is all about in the first place. Bitcoin is about avoiding centralized financial institutions. And with Foundation Devices, we are showing you guys an amazing device. It's called the Passport. And with the Passport, you can get your coins off of exchanges into custody with this beautiful, easy to use device. They also have an onboarding service that will help you get settled with your device, get comfortable with it. Get to understand what it is like to actually take custody of your Bitcoin. So check out foundationdevices.com today and make sure to pick up a passport and use the promo code BitcoinLayer for $10 off your device. So fascinating. And I didn't expect us to get into Euro dollar rabbit hole in this episode, but here we go. So my next question to you is... The fungibility of Euro dollars and U.S. domiciled bank issued dollars that is something that has always fascinated me to what extent are they fungible in the international market we know the answer is yes domestically it it is something that i wonder about and i wonder about it today 10 years ago and and in the 60s during the basically gold drain gold pool era when the when the united states had to come together and defend the uh, draw on the gold reserves, which ultimately ended up in closing the gold window and uh, and the end of the link between the gold 
system and the dollar system. So let's go back to the 60s and early 70s. Is the fungibility of the dollar and the euro and the euro dollar system a contributor to the gold drain and ultimate close of the gold window? And do you have any That's anecdotes a great there? Question. You know, I I, I don't. Um, but it, it, let's step back and, and and ask what was what was gold? What was magical about it? It's really simple, and it's not what most people think it is. It, it, everyone thought the dollar was backed by gold. No, what it really was was just a tether on the amount of U.S. dollar credit that was being issued, and it happened to be a a tether that was relatively effective, small t tether, I'm not talking about tether, the stable coin, small t tether that was really effective because um, it grew at essentially the same rate as the population growth in the world. That's, that's what gold grows at. Something like two to 3% a year is pulled out of the ground. Okay. So it was a really effective small t tether on credit growth. And what we've seen is that since that tether was broken, that credit growth has grown by leaps and bounds, not initially that quickly. In, it started in 1968. If you go back and look at cumulatively the amount of savings in the United States in the post-World War II era, um, the, the amount of non-financial sector debt was equal to the amount of savings created every year and not consumed. So that's the income generated and not consumed is the savings. And if you look at the cumulative savings and the non-financial sector debt, they were essentially equal. What does that mean? It means the U.S. had what is essentially an equity-based economy. We were not leveraging. Sure, there was debt, but all that debt was backed by, by actual savings. It was a dollar-for-dollar equity-financed economy and far healthier than what we have today where everything is, there's no tether on the debt, right? And so here's, back to the to point about the Fed losing control of the euro dollar market, the Fed has zero control over how many US dollar balances are issued by offshore banks. That's the point about why I'm so surprised that it didn't try to rein in control of the US dollar stablecoin market. And by the way, Custodia was one of the ways that it could have done that to say, listen, you have to be a Fed member bank in order to issue a U.S. dollar stablecoin. And a Fed member bank is directly regulated by the Fed, but you saw what the Fed did to Custodia it, it, uh, in conjunction with the White House, not only denied us, but did it in a disparaging way with facts, factual inaccuracies that it refused to correct and sent a message uh, to everyone, don't, don't even approach us to apply for something like this uh, by, by, by issuing a denial letter that was 41 times longer than the longest ever denial letter ever issued by the Fed, okay? So that was meant to send a clear message that it doesn't want any, any, anybody getting a bank charter and becoming a stablecoin issuer um, and, and, and being regulated by the Fed. It wants all this to be done in the shadows by entities that it doesn't regulate. And it says that it wants to regulate all these entities, but if you look at what it actually did, that's not the case at all. It sent a very clear message. It does not want these entities to be regulated by the Fed. So it's all in the euro dollar market. And I think it's just very interesting. Look at what's happening with Tether. It's, it just keeps, um, Tether the stablecoin keeps getting uh, uh, at the highs in terms of issuance. That is entirely offshore. I have never been able to figure out who holds and clears Tether's U.S. dollar balances, it is almost certainly not a U.S. bank. Um, and, and that means that it's a non-U.S. bank that's, that's, uh, that's clearing U.S. dollars for Tether. Think about that. The Fed is not in control of those U.S. dollar balances. That's right. And from a layered money perspective, let's just explain what we're talking about here. We're talking about the link between Fed money, which is reserves and cash that it issues out into the system, the link between that money and U.S. domicile deposits is very direct. But the link Correct. between the Fed 100%. created money and non-U.S. bank issued dollar deposits is a, a large question mark and essentially doesn't exist. And what Caitlin is explaining is that the Fed has relegated stablecoin issuance to that question mark side of the pyramid not and and 
on purpose, not subsuming it within its own monetary hierarchy structure when it could by issuing charters to stablecoin issuers. Uh, and, and that's where we are. What, that's what the Fed is doing. It is denying the stablecoin realm from its own hierarchy and relegating Correct. it into the euro dollar realm. Correct. With one, uh, one, one small correction where you mentioned the Fed issuing charters, the Fed is not a chartering authority. The way the United States system is set up, there are two major utilities that, are, that Congress designed to be available to all banks. The chartering authorities are the 50 states. Have all, they've always chartered banks in the United States. And then in 1863, the national chartering authority called the OCC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency, was created. Okay? And so we have what's called a dual banking system. Those are the chartering authorities, the OCC and the 50 state bank chartering authorities. The utilities are the Fed and the FDIC. The FDIC is the insurance company that is to be available to all the chartered banks. And the Fed operates the U.S. dollar payment system that is also to be available to all eligible banks. And if you go look at, the, at federal law and the Monetary Control Act of 1980, it's crystal clear. Congress intended the Fed to provide services to all eligible depository institutions. The, the Fed does not get to choose who gets chartered. It's the chartering authorities who choose who gets chartered. That's where the weeding out takes place. The Fed and the FDIC must service the depository institutions that make it through their chartering processes. But here's the thing. In the last few years, that both the Fed and the FDIC have politicized those decisions and started to pick and choose who gets services and who does not. And we just saw that in a very big way with who got to be among that first group of Fed master account holding institutions that are certified for Fed now. Thank you for bringing our attention to this, and this is why we have Caitlin on so that she can explain what is actually happening with some of the corruption in banking regulation here. And uh, whether you want to call it corruption or picking and choosing, uh, picking and choosing winners, we have a system here that is clearly tiered and, uh, and highly politicized. So we want to bring awareness yes. to this concept um, as well as teach the audience what is going on today in the banking sector. Now, Caitlin, the last thing I want to ask you before I uh, let you go here is Gary Gensler, the SEC. What is going on there? Another example of maybe your opinion, something highly politicized in its involvement. But – Aside from what's going on at the SEC and, get, and with Gensler, does it actually matter for Bitcoin, yes or no? No, it doesn't matter for Bitcoin. Bitcoin's immune to all this, all this crap. Uh, and, and I've been much more nuanced in my critique of both the Fed and the SEC, by the way. Um, uh, they both are deserving of, of the vitriol that they're getting in some ways, but I'll defend them in others. And I think the SEC has done some things right in enforcing the fraud laws against some of the outright criminals and scammers. Uh, they, they missed, obviously, FTX, um, but, uh, and then the Fed missed Moonstone, right, which FTX backdoored into what's called a charter strip acquisition without um, getting the required Fed approval, which it never would have gotten, but somehow the Fed missed that. But uh, anyway, um, the, the SEC, what's so fascinating, Nick, is that Federal agencies don't typically find themselves in litigation that really defines the boundaries of their jurisdiction. They try to avoid lawsuits like that. Uh, I just got done reading a, a, an old law review article from a couple of years ago about the Fed, how they, virtually none of its decisions are ever judicially reviewed. It is literally above judicial review in most cases. Um, and, and, and the same thing is true of the SEC to a lesser extent. Uh, but the SEC decided to bet the farm because it, it was so sure that XRP was a security. And so it went after Ripple and it turned out that it lost partially in a very embarrassing way for the SEC. Um, and if, if, if XRP, and by the way, I actually agreed with the judge's opinion. I know a lot of attorneys um, thought that the hair splitting that the judge did didn't make sense. 
uh, and, but I actually think it was a really sophisticated opinion, uh, and it and it comes down to the the manner of sale really matters, and um, the the initial offering of XRP was this judge at the district court held uh, an, an unlicensed securities offering, which I think is probably right. Um, but the secondary market sales uh, didn't violate the Howey test is what the judge held. It's, it, now, there's more nuances than that, but this is at a high level. So what's the impact to the SEC? Well, it just throws this whole question of what is a security into further disarray. Now, Bitcoin is exempt from that. Um, and I actually think most stable coins, the SEC has has not uh, opined. It did go after one of the, of the U.S. dollar stable coin issuers for securities law violations. But um, there is a, a legitimate question because there's no expectation of profit whether stable coins are, um, are securities or not. And again, the manner of sale is really going to matter. And so it's very fact specific for each, each fiat backed stable coin. But where I'm going is the SEC um, finds itself in a position it didn't expect which is that it just had its wings clipped. It just had its, it had its jurisdiction narrowed by a federal judge. And it's so interesting that there have been, there are multiple cases against federal agencies that are crypto driven. It, it's like Washington DC had this collective freak out. Uh, and I know where it's coming from because again, remember what happened to Custodia. We, we, we pretty quickly understood the White House was involved in the in the custodia member bank denial and master account applications denials um and and people came forward washington dc is a sieve it didn't take us long to figure out how political this whole thing was it's such a shock that it happened that way and we knew from the very beginning because we had it in writing from reporters that there was a coordinated effort to get the bank applicants to withdraw their bank applications or they would be voted down and Literally, we had a reporter telling us two days before the, the custodia vote by the Federal Reserve Board of Governors on its membership application that, that, the, that the vote was going to go against us. How is that possible, right? Um, and it's because it, it, it became very politicized. The Fed obviously worked with the White House for whatever reason. Uh, and, and the reporters were telling us two days, even before we had decided whether to withdraw our application or not, telling us we were going to be voted down. Right. This is how Washington works. This is this is what uh, this is. This is what those of us who are trying to work within the regulatory regime are facing. And so I'm sympathetic to a number of the lawsuits uh, that that are pushing. And it's just funny because in some ways the agencies were so arrogant about crypto and they were so sure that the judges were going to see it their way that they had all this jurisdiction like the SEC, you know, saying XRP was a security. And it turned out that they didn't get the win that they expected to get. And now their wings are clipped. So um, uh, now, now there's, uh, you've seen XRP be relisted um, by a number of the exchanges, right? And, and it's just an, it's an unusual situation because you just don't typically see agencies submitting to to the judicial branch for questions about the extent of their jurisdiction. But it's almost like they collectively had this crypto freak out and a bunch of agencies decided to let the judicial branch make these decisions rather than sit down and make rational decisions themselves. Absolutely fascinating. Caitlin Long, founder and CEO of the, of the politically targeted Custodia Bank, uh, targeted by the White House and singled out by the Federal Reserve. It is an important message. We hope you, the audience, will help spread this message. It's it's we're, we're not trying to be pro or con for Custodia Bank here. We have no affiliation with yeah. Custodia here at the Bitcoin Lair. We yeah. are trying to uh, explain what is going on right now in the regulatory regime from both the Fed and the U.S. government executive and legislative branches, uh, as well as some of the regulatory agencies. Caitlin, thank you so much for coming back on, and we can't wait to have you back and pick your brain again. Let's see how this all evolves. It's always good to talk to you, Nick. I love that you're so interested in this Euro-dollar system, and uh, boy, you and I, from the very get-go, just hit it off about some of these crazy things that Wall Street 
does that they were going to be bringing into Bitcoin and Bitcoin was going to bite them back. And we've saw, we've seen it. We're going to see it again and again. So the more we can get the message out, the, right. the more folks can learn. There's nothing quite as multidisciplinary as Bitcoin. And I think that's what attracts right. uh, people like us to the industry. So Caitlin, thank you so much again. And uh, we'll, we'll catch you again soon. Yes, indeed. Thanks, Nick. Special thanks to River for sponsoring this channel. Purchase Bitcoin without any fees when you use River's DCA feature. River has become our trusted source of accessing the Bitcoin market because they don't use any third party custodians. This is a very, very important thing to understand. River is not using another company to store the Bitcoin for them. They have their own multi-signature solutions, which means that they have designed their own way to make sure nobody else has responsibility for the Bitcoin for the time that you have River hold your Bitcoin for you on their platform once you have purchased it. So go check out river.com today. Thanks for sticking with us as always at the Bitcoin layer. Subscribe to our channel. Subscribe to our Substack at the bitcoinlayer.substack.com so that you can follow along our latest research and analysis.